I'm not going to say that because someone read it yesterday and I said, oh, okay, I'm just going to let it be seen. Because, uh, but, you know. Uh, hello, good morning. Um, I'm going to, before I get into my talk, and I'm going to be speeding because there's a lot of content, uh, allow me two things. The first thing that I want to um, give a shout out are. Uh, Mike Little and Matt Mullenweg for coming up with this idea and most of all deciding to make, turn this into an open source project and uh, giving us something to um, do our blogs, build our businesses, but most of all create a community, uh, which of all the WordPress things for me was and is the most valuable. And the second thing that I want to celebrate with you was uh, um, the uh, results of the referendum in Ireland yesterday uh, because I think it was awesome. I spent most of, fr of Friday crying for like no real reason except it was, everything was very moving. And the other reason is, brings me to this very special uh, slide because um, as a woman and as an older woman in tech, um, I am a minority. And Yoast has a fund to support minorities come to speak. And without them, I wouldn't be here. Uh, so I'm very grateful. But I also want to speak more and more about the need that we have for more women and more older women. Tammy spoke about listening. Um, I was at a event a few months ago uh, in Milan. I live in Milan, nearby, um, at Accenture Interactive, which is, you know, they get to do a lot of really big, important projects. And the panel was five people. Five men, white, and the second guy started off saying, you know, we are a team of 200, and we're like scattered in four different cities, and the average age is 26. And I wanted to get up and leave, because I was like, the average age is 26. And I did some math. I mean, not a good math, because I'm a designer. I'm not you know, a, a nerd. But I kind of said, so that would make like the oldest people in the team be 35? And you guys want to des design things for me, let alone my mom? But so diversity is really important. That said, how about you? Uh, how many designers? OK, hi. <laughs> How many developers? OK. How many marketers? OK. I'm trying. I'll ask you later what the other of you do. <laughs> but anyway, so well, hello, brands. Because we are all brands today. And I'm going to try and show you how we got there. Meanwhile, this is me. I, I do a lot of things. I used to be embarrassed because I grew up at a time where if you did a lot of things, you were bad at all of them. And if not, if, I, I've discovered that no, it's not true. Um, these are the three representations and at the end of my talk, you're going to, they're going to make more sense than now. And I want to go over three things with you today. The first thing is what a brand is and what a brand is not. The second is to show you a little bit about how the idea of branding has evolved because it has taken on more and more meanings. And the third is I'm going to give you my little blueprint of how to go about branding. So let's go. Okay, and usually this is, there's a like, what? what do you mean? 
And what I mean is that a brand is not a logo. These are not synonyms, okay? Um, this happens all the time. You hear people referring to a logo as a brand and vice versa, and they're not. And I'll show you what I mean. Um, what is this? Nike, right? So this is Nike, right? This is Nike. The attitude, the, the, the mission, their vision, their, what they want us to feel about them. So this is Nike's logo, but this is Nike, okay? It's that thing, you know? And we usually get like, also, uh, we get parties. It's like Canon and Nikon, you know, Nike and like Adidas, you know, it's like, I like <laughs> leaning here, I'm not leaning there. Another example. Okay, most of you are going to know what this is. Do not say it. This is a logo, right? By all means, right? But it's not a brand. This is the brand. Okay. This is the logo of the New Zealand All Blacks. It's a symbol. It's, it's a design. It's a visual icon. But it's not the brand. It's the representation of a set of intangible values that set us, our company, our product, apart from something else. So the brand is that set of intangible values. Okay? That's why we talk about brand equity. To borrow from Han Handley, who borrowed from Z. Frank, and me, now, <laughs> the brand is the emotional aftertaste. I like that a lot, because this is what's happening more and more. You know, when we meet a brand, we almost get the same feeling that we get when we meet a person. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I like you, or I don't like you, you annoying me right off the, you know, from the start. So a logo we can think of as a two-dimensional icon of a multi-dimensional experience, which is the brand. And I'm sure that if you look at any one of these, you get that feeling, right? You get it, you recognize it, and it triggers something in your mind. Can be positive, can be negative, can be neutral, but it's something that goes beyond, you know, the design. But how did we get here? So the first thing, the first practice of branding, and it started about 50,000 BC, is ownership. And the purpose of the first branding uh, was to recognize someone's property from someone else's property. So there is evidence in the Lascaux caves of uh, cattle marked, probably with uh, paint or tar, to be distinguished from others. And there are Egyptian funerals and mm, documentation that, uh, that depict branding in, the, in a more permanent way, which started about 2000 BC, which is through burning. And in fact, um, branding comes from uh, the Norse brander, or I don't know if it's pronounced right, but you know, sorry, I'm from Italy, uh, which means to burn. So the second need solved by branding was to establish a product's origin. And along with the origin, very often, uh, who made it, where it was made, um, which material, and so on. So we have um, eng um, engravings found on goods from China, Mesopotamia, Greece, India, and 
it basically also tells us that it was a need that everyone had to somehow identify their products and also the use of their products. Um, there's a whole conversation going on here. There's a lot of things written in there in Chinese uh, <laughs> that said, that gave a lot of information about that pottery. And in Rome, archaeologists have identified about 1,000 unique potter's marks uh, that were used during the first three centuries of the Roman Empire. So we can deduct that there were about 1,000 potters in, in Italy, in Rome, I'm sorry, and they all had their own little shop with their own little brand, and they were probably like, you know, the trendy you know, potter of the moment, you know, I'm going to that potter because he's, he does, you know, better things than the other. Um, and further, these are oil lamps that were found in Modena. There was a big fabric of, uh, a factory, I'm sorry, of oil lamps. And I don't know if you can see it, but they all have a little different stamp in the background, uh, in the back, in the bottom, I'm sorry. So, Fast forward to the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, guilds uh, started using marks to distinguish their work from other guilds. So printmakers and, and paper makers would use watermarks, and stone makers and quarries developed this elaborate system to identify their work or the origin of the stone. In the Renaissance, um, artists like Michelangelo started, this is a detail of the area across Mary's uh, chest. And they started signing their name instead of symbols on their artwork. And by doing so, they also started introducing the concept of authorship as opposed to, and, and recognizable authorship, as opposed to, you know, the artist just being someone that did things and who cared. Also, we get the notion of brand as a reputation. Fast forward to the Industrial Revolution and mass production equal, equaled a lot of products all the same. So, you know, how, how are my jars distinguishable from your jars? We're all making jars, but. So the first thing that people did was to brand, put signs on the containers that the goods were shipped in. And then they started branding the actual packages. And by the way, I always freak because they're like so much better than the ones, you know, like Campbell's soup. I would love to buy Campbell's soup on those, you know, like look at them now, like, oh, you eat that. Uh, we are talking late 1800s, okay? So this is like the birth of packaging. And by the late 1800s, companies had started to invest and pay money um, on branding, and so they demanded their uh, legislation so that their products could be safeguarded. So the Trademarks Registration Act of 1875 did two things. It allowed protection, so that's mine and you cannot make a copy of that, but it also allowed a brand to become um, sellable, to become company assets, and therefore the ability to give value to that intangible value that I had built for my product. Okay, so we have the factories, and the factories are doing all these nice little products, um, but I have to convince people to buy them. You know, because they're going to get there and they're going to go, okay, now there's five jars, which one should I get? 
So uh, you had convinced them that you know your product was better, and that's the you know that's where advertising comes in, right? Uh, sorry for that horrible rhyme, but there was no way to escape it. You know, every time every time I'm like I hate that. Anyway, um, there was a young guy uh, named James Walter Thompson in the early 1900s who actually had a vision, quite, you know, far-sighted vision. And his advertising agencies was the first one to establish a creative department to create content for his clients. But he went even further. He wrote two books, the Thompson Blue and read books of advertising. He wasn't like a great copywriter, you know, but can't have everything. Um, and they were actual guides for companies explaining uh, what opportunities, opportunities advertising could give them. So they were like actually advertising for advertising uh, kind of things. But basically, he introduced the concept of trademark trademark advertising, and an early definition of what today we call branding. So between 1920s and 1940s, we have print and radio advertising, because obviously advertising needs media. And their um, reach is related to media. And so, at first, budgets were dedicated to uh, newspapers and radio spots. And then, ta-da, you know, in 1942, we had in the 40, between the 40s and the 50s, at, uh, television changed everything. And now I would love to see if this can actually go. America runs on Bull of the Time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I wake you? It wasn't supposed to be that loud. But what you just saw uh, was the first ever aired commercial. No, 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 no. We're not going <laughs> to see this again. We're going to freak. Um, so that aired in 1942. And it was, you know, the first commercial ever aired. And by the late 1950s and the 60s, we know all about these guys, right? TV advertising was the advertising. And it's generally referred to as the golden era of advertising. So uh, in the 40s, I'm sorry, in the, you know, in the 50s, in the, in the first decade of television advertising and in general advertising, the, the products basically had to say, hello, I exist, buy me, okay, because there was not a lot of competition. Um, so the, the idea was the unique selling proposition. In the decades between the 50s and the 60s, we go from that to an emotional selling proposition because products start to become um, more parity. So there's more toothpastes and more soaps. And so I need people to, enjoy, to, to get some kind of emotional attachment or emotional relationship with the product. So uh, the communication becomes more about feelings, about not so much there's this product, but how is this product going to make you feel? How are you going to be better, safer, more secure, more cool, more rich looking, or better looking? So the point is give your products a personality that they can, uh, that customers can relate to. Between the 70s and the 80s, um, television sets are basically everywhere. Everyone has them, everyone has more than one. Um, so we see the rising of mass media product branding. And 
basically if you had a good commercial and a big budget so you just you know pestered people it would work people would recognize you and uh, um, and and recon recognize your product but as media theory becomes uh, you know as media becomes more important media theory becomes something to be researched and reflected on as in the works of Marshall McLuhan between the 80s and the 90s and the 90s we see communication shift from product to producers so companies begin to advertise their brand more so than their single product which actually makes sense because it gives you a wider opportunity okay if i sell you a product you know the product but if i sell you the producer and i establish a relationship with the producer then um all the other products that i may you know bring to the market start with uh, an advantage. So, nope. Um, if television was a game changer, internet was like the total revolution. Uh, between nineteen in the, in the between 1990 and 2010, um, we see everything change. Um, Amazon is, uh, was founded in 1995, Google in 97, um, WordPress in 2003, so we knew that, uh, Facebook in 2004, um, and all these guys totally changed the way we communicate. And for brands, this had two major implications, and has two major implications. The first one is that there is nowhere to hide. And we all have examples, you know, of, you know, big brand blunders like um, American Airlines dragging, or United actually, dragging a passenger out of the airplane. Or, I don't know, there's so many at this point that, you know, brands have to be very careful because whatever blunders, you know, a, a brand, whatever fail, uh, whatever mistakes a brand can make, the world is watching, the world is recording, and it just <coughs> happens instantaneously. So guard needs to be kept up. The second thing is that we all have become brands. That's because through social media, we now all can become VIPs, but we can also be attacked and judged and bullied and scrutinized. And that's something that used to be only, you know, VIPs. I mean, you know. It was like paparazzis had no interest in general people. Now the risk is that, I mean, I have a, a little story that happened in Italy, but that's applicable, uh, I'm sure, the, um, in every country. Um, w there was this like in, inside a contest in a bank and, and bank directors were asked to make these little videos uh, you know to, with with all their employees like singing a little song and whatever and one of these videos was leaked out and the poor I mean the whole the whole thing was pathetic but like and the whole idea was pathetic but this woman uh, who was in the video was the video you know made to uh, reached Facebook and by within a few hours she was like the butt of the joke of the entire country and it was horrible um, you know her kids were like picked on at school she had to close her Facebook account I mean it was really really horrible and she's like 
you know, there's no one. It's me, you, any one of us. So, uh, but, you know, the good part is that we can all be influencers. If you, uh, when I was young, a kid wanted to be a soccer player and a girl like a ballerina, okay? Um, now I think you ask any kid, they want to you know, be rich doing videos on YouTube, something like that, right? So Chiara Ferragni is, she's now I think 31. Uh, she was one of the first fashion bloggers. Her net worth in 2016 was of $12 million. Not bad, starting a fashion blog. Um, my absolute favorite in the world, the only real deserving star, Grumpy Cat, has a total reach of 68 million followers. And I mean, she deserves it, okay? She deserves it. Uh, when I was doing research for this, I found out that uh, this lovely girl, who was, I think she's 29 now, um, she has a total reach of 247 million people. I, do any of you know her? Okay, so I, I wonder who are they, because I had no clue. And I actually went on YouTube and looked for her, and she does these like really kind of funny videos that totally like I could not get. So I was like, uh, yeah, uh, okay. So I'm not in Target, I guess. So, but again, okay, to, you, you make a lot of money. You do this for a living. Uh, it's, it's a job. What do you want to be? An influencer. Okay. So, branding has evolved, right? From defining ownership to defining the origin and quality of something to identify that project to dif differentiate that project from a uh, product, I'm sorry, from uh, something like it, to become a company, asset, so sellable, to be a status symbol, okay? How many people do you know that are just so, you know, oh, I have that watch, or I have that car, you know? Today, your brand is your kept promise to your customer. Um, or to put it in the words of Jeff Bezos, is what other people say about you when you're not in the room, okay? Which is reputation, basically, okay? So, this is all cool, right? People, big companies with big budgets, with, you know, advertising agencies, you know, what about us? You know, what, what can we do? Should we build or manage or work or tend to our personal or business brand? And how? And the answer is obviously yes to the first question. And how, I'm going to show you. Uh, this, of course, is my you know, blueprint, that's how I go about it. It applies to any size of brand because it's just the logical process. So the first thing that you need to know is who are you? What do you do? If you're a product, what do you do? It's very hard to sell something that it's, if it's not really, really clear in your mind, and if we talk personal brand, this is actually not as easy to do as if you do it for a product. Because personal brand is like, you know, like, who am I? Who do I want to be? And, you know, identifying that is not easy, but is very important. It's point number one. Point number two is who are you talking to? Your target, right? If you don't know your target, every communication you do 
could be right, could be wrong, could be somewhere in the middle. Know your market. Okay, so you and your target are in a market. You know, who else is there? Um, how do you make, you know, how are you different from the rest and how, what makes you valuable or different than everything else? And to know, to answer number three, you need to know who the others are because otherwise it's a bit hard. You need to have a clear vision of where, of where you want to go. And if you don't, you need to get one. Um, because it's like going on a road trip. I mean, you may not really have, you know, the exact spot location, but north, south, east, west, you know, more or less, that's what I want to achieve. If you don't have that clear, it's very hard to communicate that. Remember that bit about you know, people have smartphones and they can like tape you doing really bad things and tweet about it in no time. Values are important today. And you're going to be held by, the, by those values. Um, even if you're a pizza place, you know, if you say my pizza is the cheapest, then it has to be. If it's super good, then it has to be. If it's vegan, it has to be, okay? If it's organic, people should not be thinking, is it really going to be organic? You know, because that's not good. There's another pizza place. You got to have a plan. You know, I'm so glad to see that this morning, uh, you know, um, other speakers spoke about having a strategy. Um, for a long time, at least for me, maybe, maybe it's just me, having a strategy was kind of sneaky. You know, like if you had a strategy, you had some kind of agenda, you know. And so I always like, you know, felt kind of weird, but it's not. You got to have a strategy. Again, you're doing, a, you know, you want to go to London. Fine. Your strategy is how am I going to go to London? I'm going to walk there? I mean, you could, you know, you could, uh, but you got to know it, okay? Or are you going to, like, bike to London? Are you going to take an airplane to London? And when? And how much time do you have? And, and what's the purpose, okay? So all these things need to go into a strategy so that your actions are not random. This is the mind for random. Okay, it is only now that we talk logos. Up until now, there's no mention of logo, of design, of, you know, colors, none. Okay, now is I have a plan, I know, what I'm, I know who I am, I know who you are, I know where we're going, I got my strategy worked out. So now I can start convey my personality. And I can do, and I can do this through graphic design. Yeah, now we can call the designer, um, or we can call our nephew in high school. Whatever you know, it's an option. Um, the key here, for branding purposes, is consistency. Okay, you can't change your logos every six months. It doesn't work. You can't change your colors every six months. It doesn't work. You know, it's, it's a visual code, and people need to be able to recognize you. Otherwise, it's like you're resetting the whole thing every time. The second is the tone of voice and the type of language. Again, target. If I'm selling skateboards to teenagers, I'm going to speak to them in a certain way. If I sell earring aids to... Senior citizens, I'm going to speak in a different way, probably loudly in the second case, but you know. So, and again, you have to be coherent. You know, you can't be super funky 
in your image, but then you speak like a, you know, a lawyer, you know, all of this has to be coherent and make sense. Then you need to think about your communication. You know, wait, how? What are the better channels? Okay, and again, it has to do with who's your target. Okay, if you're talk, if you're selling earring aids to senior citizens, you're probably going to opt for certain places to put your communication in. Probably not Snapchat. Probably not Twitter as well. Uh, you know, and, and vice versa. And the key here is competence, because this is not something that you just know. So when you get to this stage, you might want to ask someone for professional help. And then whatever you're selling, you have a customer. And your customer has an opinion about how you treat them. And if you don't treat them nice, they ain't going to be happy. And it used to be they would just go home and say to their five friends, I am not ever going to buy that you know, bread at that bakery. But now they may be influencers and they get to Twitter and they t tweet to their 247 million followers that bakery sucks. That's bad for business. Okay, we go back to the original recipe. Point number nine, don't skimp. I mean, it's, you know. So you don't have a huge budget, that's fine. But you got to put some effort and love and, and think that this is not going to be a cost zero. Even if it's just your time, you know, writing your blog post or posting to Facebook or attending your Facebook page or whatever. It, it ain't going to happen by itself. It's also not going to happen all by itself if you're at the beach. So you got to work on it. You got to stay consistent. You got to check, check often. Make sure that you haven't, you know, steered away from your original path. And this you don't have to do, but it's really nice and it works better if you do. You know, being mindful, listening to, as you know, Tammy was saying before, you know, paying attention. You're in whatever context with your customer, with your clients. So, you know, you could ignore them, but it's probably not going to work out very well. Now. If all of this applies to your personal brand, steps one through seven are the same. Rules nine through 11 are the same. Point eight, personality. If you're working on your personal brand, it has your personality, okay? Maybe you curb it a little, you know? But it's, it, it has to be true to you. Okay, if you are super funky, yeah, and you know, shoot them or so they shut up kind of people, colorful and friendly, and then reflect that. It's, or vice versa, if you're like very serious and introvert, I mean, you're not going to have like a website that it's all blank and has nothing in it, but you don't have to pretend you're like super friendly, I love everybody. You can just be yourself, just sort of like your nicest possible self. So all this is to say that a brand is not a logo, but you know that already. Your brand is organic. It's, it's an organic, living, breathing being that can be, you know, nurtured, uh, made to grow, or it can also be made to die, a horrible death, if you don't treat it really nice. So you have to give it your best. You have to, it's your baby. Just really think of it as your baby. And when you step in a pool, 
think united, because we all do, you know, we're, you know, just, you know, own it, apologize it, fix it if you can, learn from it, and go on. We're human, we step on poos on occasion. Thank you. This is me. And day after tomorrow, here, there's going to be slides because I got to go home and then put them there. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.